a carnival, you may have seen sailplanes, such as these, moving in a circle. We know that the cables must exert a tremendous force on these planes to hold them in this circular path. This athlete must exert a similar force as he prepares to throw the hammer. When he releases the hammer, it flies through the air in a straight line. The reason for this is stated in Newton's first law of motion. Unless acted upon by an unbalanced force, a body in motion tends to move at a constant velocity in a straight line. To keep the hammer from moving in a straight line, the athlete must pull the wire toward him, exerting a force upon it. We call this centripetal force. There is an equal and opposite force called centrifugal force, exerted by the hammer on the athlete. But this acts on the athlete, not on the hammer. Centripetal force is the only force acting on the hammer, holding it in its circular path. Using this apparatus, which swings a metal ball in a circular path, we can measure centripetal force. The metal ball is free to move along the arm. As the ball pulls on the cable, the force exerted is shown by the scale. This will be the centripetal force acting on the ball when it begins moving. Let's start using this ball. The actual mass is 50 grams. To simplify our demonstration, we'll call the ball 1M for one unit of mass. We'll call the distance from the ball to the center of the arm 1R for one unit of radius. We'll turn on the motor and adjust it to a low speed, which we have previously selected. The velocity at which the ball is now moving, we'll call 1V for one unit of velocity. This velocity has been selected so that the centripetal force is also 1. We'll call this 1F for one unit of force. We get a force of 1F when the quantity of mass is 1M, the velocity is 1V, and the radius is 1R. Now let's see what the centripetal force is when, in place of this ball having a mass of 1m, we use this ball having a mass of 2m, or twice the mass of the first ball. We'll keep the radius and velocity the same as before, so that doubling the mass of the ball is the only change. This gives us a centripetal force of 2 units. The centripetal force is 2f, when the radius is 1r, the velocity is 1v, and the mass is 2m. Doubling the mass doubles the centripetal force. This shows that the force varies in direct proportion to the mass. Now we'll put back the 1m ball and vary a different factor. We'll use the unit mass and unit radius that we started with. But this time, we'll adjust the speed of the motor so that we double the velocity of the ball. Now look at the scale. Four units of force. The centripetal force is 4F when the mass is 1M, the radius is 1R, and the velocity is 2V. Doubling the velocity makes the centripetal force four times as great, or two squared. And so the force varies in direct proportion to the velocity squared. This time, the same one unit mass is set at half the previous distance, that is, at one half the unit radius. The motor speed is set so the ball travels at the original unit velocity. To hold the ball in its circular path now, a two-unit force is required. So, two units is the centripetal force when the mass is 1m, the velocity is 1v, and the radius is one-half r. Half the radius 
gives us double the centripetal force. So the force varies in inverse proportion to the radius. The complete relationship we can state this way. The centripetal force varies directly as the mass, directly as the square of the velocity, and inversely as the radius. This relationship becomes an equation when the quantities are expressed in appropriate metric units. If the force is measured in newtons, a standard metric unit of force, then the mass is measured in kilograms. The velocity is measured in meters per second. And the radius is in meters. This formula can be used for solving many problems involving objects moving in a circular path. For example, instead of a metal ball whirling about the shaft of a motor, we might have a satellite moving in a circular orbit around the Earth. The force of gravity between the Earth and satellite provides the centripetal force needed to hold the satellite in this path. This force must be equal to the mass of the satellite, m sub s, times its velocity squared, divided by the radius of its circular path. Using this formula, we can find the velocity needed to hold the satellite in orbit if we know the force of gravity. We can find F, the force of gravity, using Newton's law. F is proportional to the product of the Earth and satellite masses, m sub e and m sub s, divided by the square of the distance between them. In this case, the distance is the radius of the satellite's path. When this is multiplied by g, a universal gravitational constant, it becomes equal to the force in newtons. If the masses are in kilograms and the radius is in meters. We can equate this formula with that for centripetal force and then solve for the velocity. First, divide both sides by m sub s, the mass of the satellite. Then, multiply both sides by r, the radius. So g, the gravitational constant, times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the orbit is equal to v squared. Taking the square root of both sides gives us the value for v. g and the mass of the Earth stay constant. So the velocity is determined by the radius of the satellite's path. The radius is equal to the radius of the Earth which is about 4,000 miles, plus the distance of the satellite from the Earth. Suppose this is 500 miles. Then the radius of the satellite's path is 4,500 miles, or about 7 million meters. For the radius in our formula, we'll use this value, 7 million meters. Then using the mass of the Earth in kilograms, and the appropriate gravitational constant, we can solve for the velocity. If we go through the necessary calculations, we will find that the velocity is about 7,500 meters per second, or about 17,000 miles per hour. This is the velocity scientists know a satellite must reach if it is to be launched into a circular orbit 500 miles above the Earth. Finding the velocity needed to place a satellite into orbit is just one of many problems we can solve with our understanding of centripetal force, the force which can deflect an object's motion into a circular path.